to remind us of the role that race, religion, and ethnicity have played in the past and how hatred and the evil of genocide continue to stalk the world, Anne and Emmett meet somewhere in time, another world, where they move back and forth into the past and present, and we pick it up right here. I'm curious, Emmett, why did they hate you? Different color skin. That simple, I guess. There has to be more to it than color. Fair? They feared us, saw how strong we were. They felt inferior physically, sexually too. <laughs> so, so they had to hold us down, down and back, prevented us from learning how to read or write, and then claim that we were dumb, stupid. So they could limit you, dominate you, make you serve them. Exactly. I understand, Emmett, I really do. The Germans feared us for a different reason, our success. We didn't want to look like or be like them. We wanted to remain apart with our own religion and culture. We didn't need them. Since they couldn't dominate us, they wanted to destroy us physically. Domination or destruction. Th those were the choices. Right. You know, it's all just one big paradox. Paradox? Meaning what? Well, I'm white but Jewish. Yeah, and I'm black but Christian. Yet they came for both of us. It wasn't about religion or color. Like you said, it was fear. I guess haters love to hate anyone or anything they can't feel superior to. I could never understand it. We've given so much to the world. Medicine, art, music, law. What I always wondered would the world be like without us? Oh yeah, right on, eh? I heard all about those folks when I got here. There was this doctor, jo Jonas Salk. He discovered the cure for polio. It, it came, he came a little late for me. I was born with polio. It affected my speech, made me stutter. I didn't realize polio could cause stuttering. But you're OK now. It only happens when I'm nervous. Here, everything's OK. But you raise a good question about what your people have given the world. You know I'm proud of what my people have given the world, too, despite what we've had to overcome. I mean, where would America have been or be today without our free labor, our culture, our minds, and our music? It, it's so sick. America was built on the backs of us blacks. They stole everything from us. When we woke up, got educated, started demanding our rights to be treated as equals and started marching and demonstrating, they said that if we niggas didn't like it, we should go back to Africa. They felt the same way about us, Emmett, but they couldn't send us anywhere. We didn't have a place to go back then. But now? Now we have our own country, Israel, a place that's ours, where Jews can live as Jews, practice our traditions, and worship God. You still believe? Yes. In God? After all that's happened? Yes. I refuse to surrender to despair. I mean, that's the alternative, isn't it? Well, not for me. No, I believe that mankind is basically good. Really? I look into a baby's eyes and I see innocence. Goodness. Yes. Tell me, Ann, what did you see in the eyes of the Nazi? Hate, evil. You know, something I can never figure out. I praise God. I, I prayed to him. I, I promised to be good. And I was, mostly. When they came for me that night at my great uncle's house in Mississippi, I cried out, begged God to help me. He didn't hear me. He wasn't there. I hear you, Emmett. I, I prayed too. It didn't save me either. But I think that we may be asking too much. I mean, to think that God has to listen to hundreds of millions of us at every moment. But what's a God for if he doesn't listen to us when we really need him? I'm not sure that God is a he <sighs> or a she 
for that matter. I think God is a moral force, a power that creates, gives life, makes the dawn safe. And then what? Moves on to some other planet? We have landlords like that, absentee landlords. Let everything go. Never made any repairs. It's complicated. I mean, I don't have all the answers. Something I can never figure out. How did God let Satan, that snake, into the Garden of Eden? Or why can't God just kill Satan, just whoop him and throw him off the planet? I don't know. I struggle with the question all the time. Sometimes I wonder whether evil is just some dark force floating around the universe waiting to enter the human heart, to feed off it and grow stronger with every act of cruelty. Are you saying that you think evil needs us to live? Maybe it's we who need evil so that we can know kindness, decency, and goodness. <laughs> Maybe we could never appreciate perfection if everything was already perfect. Now that's heavy. You mean there's no day without night, no, no love without hate. So hate and murder are always going to be with us. Or then. Are you all still a bunch of haters? You always going to be out there just waiting no, for us. No, Emmett. They don't have to be out there. Hate doesn't have to live inside them or us. Not always. Not if we're willing to recognize the face of evil and drive it out before it becomes too strong. Some good has come out of all the evil that we've seen. I believe that there is goodness in people, that there's redemption in the world, that evil doesn't win in the end, that God won't forsake us. I believe this. Come off it, Anne. Take a look around. We always seem to be the ones left behind, the forsaken ones. What happened when Hurricane Katrina struck? Who were the ones left behind? What about Rwanda? Who are the ones dying in Darfur, Sudan? Emmett, I understand why you're down. I really do. People have no idea what it was like to live with eight scared people all crammed into a small place. There was no privacy. We couldn't move around, make any noises, or do anything that might let the Nazis know we were there. Could they hear our voices, we wondered? Could they detect our movements, our anger, our petty jealousies? We had a cat that kept urinating everywhere. <laughs> do you know what cat urine smells like? Like fear. The smell of fear was in our hair, our hands, our clothes. We couldn't wash it away. Then the plumbing stopped. We were trapped. My father tried hard to hold everything together. I miss him most of all. It was just, I used to write just to find some place where I could go to be alone. When we fled from Germany, I had to leave everything behind. My friends, my cat, Morche. I really loved her. She was my best friend. That's why I wrote all the letters in my diary, Dear Kitty. But I realized that we had suffered for centuries, but somehow managed to keep on living. The suffering made us stronger, made us survivors. You've got to have faith, Emmett. Courage, determination, solidarity. That will defeat all the haters. It's kind of ironic, if you think about it. but. My murder helped spark the civil rights movement. And the murder of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. sort of ended it. And now it didn't end racism, that's for sure. It just marked the end of the civil rights movement. White people were so ashamed of what they had done and so scared of what we might do, they finally started giving us some opportunities to let us in places, open up jobs, treat us the way the law said they were supposed to. But there's been some backsliding. And much as white folks don't like to hear it, there's still one rule for whites and another for blacks. Still after all this time? I mentioned Katrina. You know what happened to our folks who lost their homes, their families, their pets, everything? 
the federal government sent them a bunch of cheap trailers to live in. Puff a wind would have knocked them down. They weren't worth a damn. But worse, they were soaked in formaldehyde. Stuff could kill you or muddle your brains. It, it, it was just like when they gave the Indians blankets loaded with smallpox when they stole the red man's land. Fannie Lou Hamer used to say about racism being so, so sick and tiring. I'm sick and tired of, of being sick and tired. Listen, it's a beautiful musical written by George and Ira Gershwin about the lives of Porgy and Bess. It's been called America's first opera. Yeah. Two Jewish brothers writing about the lives of black folk. I'm amazed they can make it all seem so romantic. I know it was a big hit, but I don't like the song Summertime. Why not? Because it was the summertime when they came for me in Mississippi. I was living in Chicago and went to visit my relatives. That's when they tortured me and threw my body in the Tallahatchie River. I was beaten so badly, the only way that they could tell it was me was because I was wearing my father's ring. It, it has his initials LT on it. It broke my mother's heart to, to see what they had done to me. An all-white jury acquitted the crackers who murdered me in a, in a matter of an hour or so. And after the trial, they gave an interview to Life magazine and admitted that they were guilty and laughed how they got away with it. Emmett, you know, they came for me in the summertime, too. But I still love that song. Yeah, but the living ain't never been easy for us. I'm really sorry, Emmett. Didn't anyone warn you to be careful in Mississippi that, that it was more dangerous for black people in the South? Oh, sure. My mother warned me about the danger. My cousins told me I had to be afraid, be careful to mind my ways when it came to white folks, not to look them in the eye. Be sure to call them sir and ma'am. Step off the sidewalk when a white folk pass by. Shuffle and scrape, look like a happy Negro, just as if we was on the plantation, seven massa. Negroes there had to live in fear all the time, just as well might have had a chain and collar tied around their necks. Yes, sir. I suggest an Uncle Tom. <laughs> I was from the North, and in Chicago, we didn't have to do any of that stuff. And I was going to show my cousins that I wasn't afraid of anything. Emmett, maybe you should have listened to your mother and your cousins. I mean, you'd still be alive today if And you... maybe we'd still be jumping off sidewalks to let white folks pass. Maybe my, my breaking the rules inspired others to break the rules that were made to keep us down, licking their boots. I hadn't thought of it that way. You're right, of course. Cowardice only gives bullies more false courage. They feed on fear. It makes them even more arrogant, more brutal. I wasn't alive at the time, but your murder made a lot of news. There was a story about what happened to you in the German newspapers. You're kidding. In Germany? Now that's something. It ran in the Dusseldorf papers with a big headline. In America, a Negro's life isn't worth a whistle. Well, they got that pretty much right. Given everything that has happened to you, I, I, I don't 
I still can't believe why you said that you believe in the, the goodness of people. Well, a lot of people are really sorry for what the world allowed the Nazis to do to us. Did you know it's now a crime to insist that the Holocaust didn't exist? Was a myth? You can go to jail just for saying that. I'd call that progress. That's progress, I guess. But it's like what Malcolm said. You don't stick a knife in a man's back six inches and, and pull it out two and say you're making progress. I'm not saying that things are great. Just, just that. Get real, Anne. Anti-Semitism is always out there just below the surface, waiting to spring back up like weeds in a garden. It didn't go away because the Third Reich did. I know the world's not full of jelly beans and cotton candy. All right now, Anne, watch it when you talk about cotton. <laughs> it just meant that things were getting better for us. All those companies who stole our property and profited by using our labor and taking our lives have had to pay the families of the victims. Reparations, if you can ever repay for anything so horrible, is what they're making. It's funny. When it comes to black people, no reparations. White folks say that slavery happened too long ago. Statutes of limitations have run out. Claim they can't figure out who to pay or how much. They just tell us to shut up and forget about it. It's history. They're wrong, Emmett. Time can't erase a crime. It's never too late for justice. And if scientists can figure out how many years ago God created the universe, it seems to me they could figure out how much your people are owed. <laughs> I, I think you, you need to be careful. The U.S. State Department said that skinheads and neo-Nazis are becoming bolder, especially in Europe. I don't think we have to worry, Emmett. We won't let that happen again, ever. I hope you're right. And what are you doing up there? What are you writing? I'm just working a few more entries into my diary. Maybe I'll tell the world what I've learned since the Nazis came for us. Maybe we could collaborate and tell the world it needs to act now. Wouldn't that be great? Emmett, why don't we come up here so we can start working on it? I can't. You're a, a white girl. That's why I was murdered. Nonsense. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You sure? It's OK. Absolutely. That's all a thing of the past. Don't worry. We're all safe now. OK. Let's start talking and writing about what the world needs to know. Let's do it together.
Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if I'm live. Is it live? Would you give a hand to Elias, Elias Harris, Emma Till? And to beautiful Krista Bucalato. And Frank. And to our violinist, our fiddler on the roof. Pamela Schmalzi Ferguson. Uh, I would also like to bring to the stage the woman who took my writings from the page to the stage, the director, Robbie McCauley from Emerson College in Boston. <laughs> Robbie. <laughs> oh, wonderful job. Thank, thank you. Um, this play, I'll tell you about in a moment, but you can't imagine what it was like for them with just a few days' notice to come here. Krista, you were in New York or Connecticut? New York. Working as a waitress. Now, you know she's going to be an actress. <laughs> during the summer, and Elias is in school. His family is here. I think Krista's family, uh, they're here. And Robbie is still teaching. And I said, please come. We're putting this conference together. I know you're not ready. We, we did the reading in April at Emerson College, and it was a reading. It wasn't a full-blown play. And they're performing in front of Lou Gossett, an Academy Award-winning <laughs> actor. So Don't you know they. Don't remind me. Don't remind me. <laughs> Don't remind me. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to thank you all, but I also want to thank the audience for your endurance all day. And I know you'll forgive that we didn't have costumes, we didn't have lighting and sound effect, and we want to thank the National Press Club for being our house, our theater tonight. Thank you. I just. I, I just have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask Krista. Is what was it about Anne Frank that helped you build the character? Um, thank you. I think um, the thing that most drew me to Anne was her, her faith and the line that I'm, most of us remember from her diary, that she still believes in the goodness of people no matter what. And I think having that innate sense of, of confidence and belief that people will do the right thing is really important um, and that she she just trusts and believes and I, I really love that about her. Thank you and that's what I love. That's what inspired me to want to have this conference today was Anne Frank and her faith and belief in the goodness of people. Elias, what was it about Emmett Till that empowered you to play? Um, for me, I, when I went back and did a lot of the history and the searching of Emmett Till, because I wasn't quite familiar with it as I should have been. Um, I discovered that Emmett's mother was a guiding inspiration to him. He was a mama's boy, in essence. So I started thinking, that's what he left behind on Earth, and that's what he probably regrets leaving behind the most. So I started thinking of his mother and his mother's story, especially after with the whole um, casket showing to Jet Magazine and displaying his face for for it to become a public icon. Um, and that, that, that her story started inspiring me and, and also the story of the um, two individuals who murdered him because I, I, that wasn't an initial thought, but they were with him at one of the most personal moments in his life or at the end of his life when he died. And um, any person who had a personal connection to him to, in that, of that magnitude continued to tell his story. So I thank them only for that, and I thank his mother for being such a guiding force. Oh, well done. Do you know the irony is, well done, Elias. The irony is, it was the parents of Anne Frank and Emmett Till who told their stories. Otto Frank saved Anne's diary, 
And Mrs. Till Mobley was the one who said to Jet Magazine, show my boy, show the world what he did, to, or they did to my boy. And that was the beginning of the new civil rights movement. Uh, I believe Emmett Till's cousin is in the house. Simeon, are you here? Simeon, can you come up? Simeon. Is that amazing? Simeon, I want you to say hello to Elias, to everyone. Simeon is writing a book, so he can't tell you everything now. He's saving it for the book. But Simeon was there when Emmett whistled. I was in the store, yes. I was in the store with Emmett. I didn't drag him out as history say I did. Well, Kellen Bryant said that, did that. The whistle ha happened outside of the store, not inside of the store. And before I go on, I, the reason I like this play, this is the first time that I've heard the story about Emmett Till, and they then add a lie to it. <laughs> One of the lies that I hear all of the time that we dared Emmett to go into the store. William Bradford Hurry put that lie out. It's in history. He went in on his own volition. And when he went in the store, my brother Maurice sent me in behind him to make sure that he didn't say anything out of line. We walked out together. Callum Bryant came out behind us. She was walking to her car. Emmett Whistle. It scared us half to death. I appreciate you, ma'am, for not incorporating some of this stuff that's out there that's not true. And the diary of Ann Franks, this young man here, uh, I've really enjoyed what I've heard and seen. Ma'am, and you have done a great job. Uh, thank you for that. And I have one thought. Yesterday I was over at Capitol Hill. I said, from the cotton fields to Capitol Hill. <laughs> Who would have thought? J.W. Milan. Roy Bryant thought they killed Emmett Till. But after you killed the body, they couldn't do anything else to him. 53 years in August 28, it'll be 53 years. Emmett Till is the reason I'm here today on this stage, not me. It's because of Emmett Till. He is still alive in the hearts and minds of people. Thank you. Robbie, that's the best review we're going to get. <laughs> this is Robbie McCauley. It was Smitty William Smith of Emerson. It was Colette Phillips, my dear friend of Colette Phillips Global. Where are you, Colette? Who put us all together. She made this happen at Emerson College last April. But I also want to give a shout out to Mark Planning, who, smoke, who spoke earlier today who introduced me to Simeon when we did our anti-lynching policy, apology for, from the US Senate, Resolution 39. So thank you, Mark, for, for bringing us together. Uh, Robbie, I want to ask you just very briefly, what was it um, about the play that enabled you to bring it from the page to the stage? I do theater only. I teach theater. I act in theater, I write, I direct in theater. And because I also carry in me, as we all do, and we talked about so eloquently today, I carry in me the stories of race in this country. I'm always looking for material in theater that gives voice to the truth 
of these stories. And when I read your play, and the idea, the, the, the inspiration of Anne Frank and Emmett Till meeting in another place, whatever that place is, however you can name it, was absolutely inspirational to me in terms of my body and my life as well as my work. And I found these two wonderful young actors and I was not gonna not do it. <laughs> Thank you. Now we're off to Broadway, but before we do, uh, I have a, a couple of tokens of appreciation that I wanted to give you at Emerson. Uh, they're now ready here in the nation's capital. Uh, I believe somebody has, not maybe a Tony, but uh, a Revere Bowl uh, that's engraved to say, thank you, Robbie, from me. You premiered my play beautifully. I can't wait to go to Broadway. It's for you. And to Krista, she created the role of Anne Frank in my play. I love saying created the role, and you did so beautifully. You are beautiful, Anne Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Elias, to you. Thank you for playing Emma Till. Thank you. Thank you. I also have two bowls for Smitty and one for you, Colette, that will be delivered to you in the, in the audience. And before I thank everybody, I want to thank my husband. I want, to, I want to thank you. You are more than the wind beneath my wings. You are my first and last breath. You are my life. You supported me in everything. None of this would have been possible, of course, without the Gilman Foundation. <laughs> but, <laughs> but without you, my beloved, Bill Cohen. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs>